Good morning. <laughs> I hope you are having a good morning. I wanted to start singing a song. I don't remember who the uh, person was or the group was that sang it, but the song, celebrate good times. Come on. That's right. We should celebrate the good times because we belong to Jesus. Amen. That's right. I also have another song for you. You ready? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. That's right. And now some of you are going, what in the world is he doing? Why would we start a message off with the idea of sorrows and problems? Well, if you hang in there with me long enough, we'll get back to celebrate. But we need to begin by painting the picture of sorrows and problems. I'd imagine if we were transparent, every one of us here, and we had the time, we could go around and sit in this big circle. And we could go around the room, and I'd imagine that everybody here, everybody here, even the little kids could come up with a problem that they have right now. Couldn't you? I mean, right now, I would imagine that you perhaps are starting to get a list in your head of the problems that you face, and you are no different than anybody else sitting around you. We all have problems. We do. Issues with money, issues with health, issues with marriage, issues with children, issues with jobs, issues with attitudes, issues with relatives, issues with parents. Problems, problems, problems. Problems. Amen? But this morning, what I want you to do is you go through your head and you think of some of the problems that you might have, and then you think that this is true for every single person. Every single person throughout the world would come up with a list similar to the list we could come up with here with the gathering we have today. And I'm going to make a very bold statement. I'm going to say that the problems that you're thinking of and all of the rest I would think of people out there in the world, every single human being, pale in comparison to the four problems I'm about ready to reveal to you. That the problems that you're thinking of right now, the problems that people talk about when you're outside of this church building, are zero compared to the problems I'm about ready to say. Death. Dirt, debt, distance. The four greatest problems that you and I have and all of humanity has is death, dirt, debt, distance. Now let me just fill you in. Whether people know it or not, believe it or not, think about it or not, doesn't change the fact that there is a God who has created the heavens and the earth. Whether people want to believe it or not, think about it or not, study it or not, go after it or not, does not change the fact that that God has created humanity, human beings, each and every one of us, and all in the world today, created us in His image with flesh and soul. Whether human beings want to acknowledge it, think about it, study it out, doesn't matter. The fact is, is that God has revealed who He is through His creation and in an amazing, miraculous way, spoken to us, gathered it together, organized it in a way that we call the Bible. This is the inspired word. And within this inspired word, what we as human beings get a chance to do is look and read and discover that there is a creator, we are created in his image, and that we have a problem. And the problem begins any time you and I decide to step outside of what God says right is. It's a problem. Now, keep in mind that this God, whether you believe in him or not, read about him or not, that's, that's irrelevant. It doesn't change the problem that you and I have. The fact is, is that God loves us so much that he's given us his word so that if we follow it, we'll have a life that's blessed. Not necessarily easy, but blessed. One filled with joy, even though we may go through some very difficult times, we can still have joy. 
that God has laid out how to live life and have life everlasting through this beautiful, beautiful book. But what happens is, is that each individual, each person, somewhere along the line, decides to do something that God says isn't good for us. Now, keep in mind, God is not punishing us. He doesn't punish us with his word. He blesses us with his word. To follow what he says is not a punishment, it's a blessing. But we as people, we decide, you know what? I want to step outside and do something that I think I want to do, even though he says not to. Now, also keep in mind that even when you do something outside of what he says that we should do and you don't know that you're doing it, it still doesn't change the fact that God calls that sin. Now, here's where the problem begins. The very moment that you and I step outside of what God says, our souls die You know, spiritual death is not a long ailment, an illness. It's not something that lingers on. That you are alive spiritually. You are born alive in God. And then when we sin, there is instantaneous death to your soul, but yet the flesh still lives on. But your soul is dead. Dead. And do you know what that makes our bodies then? Our bodies become living coffins. Because it carries the dead soul. Think about that. Now that's a problem, isn't it? Whether you know it or not, believe it or not, follow it through or not, understand it or not, the fact is is that every single person, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Father. And that sin causes instantaneous death to the soul. We have a death problem. And then there's this dirt problem. You see, connected to this idea of sin, there's also the filth or the slime or the the, the stuff that comes along with the sin in our lives. Have you ever had one of those smudging stains? Usually it's like an oil-based stain with a little grit in it, and you get it on your pants and you try to do this, and what's it do? It just smears. You put it in the laundry. Yeah, it may fade a little bit, but it's still there. We see that's what sin does. We get this dirt problem now in our lives. There's this death problem, and now there's this dirt problem. And no matter how hard we try to clean it up and fix it ourselves, it just keeps piling on and smearing around. No matter how hard we try, well, maybe maybe we'll try some life changes. Maybe I'll do some nice things. Maybe I'll treat people nicely. Maybe I'll say I'm sorry. Let's see if that cleans the problem up. It doesn't. It doesn't fix the death problem, and it doesn't fix the dirt problem. And then there's the debt problem that we have. God loves us so much, he gives us life. Do you know how precious life is? It is priceless. The soul that God has given you and I is the very essence of life. It isn't this outside shell. It's that soul that he's given you and I. And it's priceless in his eyes. And all God requires is, is that we give that soul back to him in the same condition that he gave it to us when we take our last breath here on this earth. But here's the problem. We've killed the soul. And he won't take it back dead. That's not how he wants it returned. He wants it returned in the same condition that he gave it to us. So here we are again. Now we owe this God who created us with a precious soul. And somehow we try to figure out how we can pay off the debt of killing the very thing he gave us. So again, we try to change our lives. We try to do some nice things. We try to really make up for the things that we've done wrong. And no matter how much effort you and I put into it, we cannot pay back God for killing off the soul he's given us. And then there's this distance problem. See, this God who creates us wants to spend eternity with us, and he wants to... Walk side by side with us. He wants to have an intimate relationship with us. But as we read in his word, as soon as sin takes place, death, dirt, debt, distance. He leaves. 
He can't fellowship sin. As much as he wants to spend eternity with us, he can't do it because he's a pure and holy God. Now, folks, I'd like to suggest that these are the biggest problems mankind faces. Wouldn't you? Death, dirt, debt, distance. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, the same God, the same God who creates the heavens and the earth and breathes life into us and gives us this beautiful soul and this beautiful body to carry the soul in, He loves us so much that He knew we'd have the death, dirt, debt, distance problem, and he knew that there's no way we could fix it on our own. So he sends him to come to this earth to live a life without sin, sacrifice him on the cross, three days later raise him up, never to die again, lift him up into heaven, and send his Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, God has fixed the problem of death, dirt, debt, distance. Because Jesus defeated death, he has the right now to offer life to those who are dead, spiritually. Because of his blood shed on the cross, he offers the only cleansing tool to get to the deep dirt and grime that we've committed when we cause sin. That Jesus, taking every single sin of every human being for all time, nails himself to that cross, and God the Creator says that is sufficient payment for everybody's sin. Now the debt problem has been taken care of. And he sends his son to send back the Holy Spirit so God can literally live inside of us. Fixing the distance problem. Amen. This is the God that we love. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God not by the works of man, so that no one can boast. So the only way, the only way we can take this dead, dirty, debt-ridden, distant soul to give it back to God so he can do the fixing is through Christ. And if we don't, whether you believe it or not, study it or not, want to listen to it or not, it doesn't change the fact that a dead, dirty, debt-ridden, distant soul will spend eternity alive and yet dead. I don't know if you really believe that or not, but the fact is, is that he revealed it to be true, and that is true. That's a problem. I don't want to die for eternity. I don't want to be dirty forever. I don't like being dirty. I don't like being in debt. I most assuredly don't want to be distant from my God. Lord, help me. How can I come back to you? That's what this series of sermons has been all about. It's how to get from death to life, dirty to clean, in debt to debt free, distant to being one with God. You guys in on this? So here's what we have now. We have this issue. Is it behind me? I don't see it there. Thank you. See, it's this big debate. This big debate is to exactly when does this take place? When does somebody go from being dead spiritually to alive, dirty spiritually to clean, in debt to debt free, distant to having God live inside? 
We've gotten to the point now of the series where we've taken this journey. And it is all about Jesus and learning about Christ and learning about God's plan and believing that he is the creator and believing we are created in his image and believing that Jesus came to die on a cross and he did and he went to a tomb and he did and he came out three days later and he did and he ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit and he did to believe in these things so much to love God so much and knowing that we have these issues and problems that we cannot solve, but we want to have life and life everlasting, so we want to willingly give ourselves back to the only one who can get us there. That's where we're at in this study. This is not some sort of part-time commitment. There is an absolute moment where within your mind and heart, you need to finally make that decision. Do I want to give everything over to him or not? Who here, raise your hand if you're married. Let me ask you a simple question. When you were engaged, were you still single? The answer is yes. You may have promised that you are going to get married, but you had yet to be married. I say this, if, if you have been one of the ones uh, who I have done your wedding for, you, you know that on the day of the wedding, the day of the wedding, I talk to the bride and the groom, and I tell them, this is your last chance. If you're not all in, if this is not going to be a lifelong commitment for better, for worse, in sickness and health, in richness and in all poorness, if this is not what you're willing and intended to do, to be all in and tied together, knotted together as one for the rest of your life on earth, if you are not willing to endure the hardships, endure the difficulties, and rejoice for the times when you have times to rejoice together, if you're not that committed, run Especially if you're the groom. Because the future father-in-law will hunt you down because of all they put into the wedding. You are not married until you come to the altar. Until you exchange the vow, the promise, the covenant. Until you exchange that ring that shows this symbol of what you're doing and until you're pronounced because of your dedication to one another to God that you are now in a covenant relationship with him to be one for the rest of your life it is not until that moment that you're married we talk about spiritual death there is a moment you go from death to life. When we're talking about being dirty spiritually, there's a moment where you go from being dirty to clean. It's not this long process. It's not this, well, I'm dead spiritually, but I'm a little bit more alive spiritually than I was before. No, dead is dead. I think of that movie, um, Johnny Depp, pirate movie. Pirates of the Caribbean, you ever see that movie? And that, that old freaky looking guy, do you feel dead, Jack Sparrow? <laughs> I think of that. Because you're either dead or you're alive. You're not kind of dead or kind of alive. You either are or aren't. And when we're talking about somebody's soul, and at the moment that sin takes place, death immediately happens to the soul. There is a moment that God has prepared and created and revealed through his son to go from death to life, from dirty to clean, from in debt to debt free, from distant to connected to God forever. There is a moment that that takes place. And it's not in the dating stage. It's not in the engagement stage. It's that moment when you are married to him him because you've exchanged the vow and the covenant. You see, when something dies, there is a funeral that you bury something because you bury the dead. Jesus teaches us through his word 
that there needs to be a funeral to have a new birth. There needs to be a washing to have a regeneration. There needs to be the exchange of a covenant and a vow and a promise and a life given wholly over to God in a marriage ceremony with Jesus if you want to have your problem solved. The big debate is, at what point does this happen? This is where, church, I'm going to ask you to please do me a favor. You listening? You're going to have to turn off the traditional worship sermon style mentality from this point until at least we get to the end of this section of this series. I'm asking you, to become students. I'm asking you to take on the mentality of Tad, I want to learn. Now I know that I'm speaking to the majority of you who know the punchline. Tad, it's baptism. It's the moment at which by faith I give my life to Christ, repent, confess, and be baptized. Tad, that's that funeral that you're talking about. That's the tomb that you're talking about. That's the burial that you're talking about. That's the covenant that you're talking about. That's the vow that you're talking about. That's that moment at which that I can be infused with the blood of Christ, washed by Him, filled with His Spirit, come up out of that tomb and be alive again through Him because that's what He says, Tad, and that's what I did. You are absolutely right. But we have so many people who will debate us on that fact. That what we need to do and be prepared is to have a loving, truth-based response to what they believe in. Because our job, if you remember, as Christians, is to seek and Save the lost. Why not start with the people that we know who already believe in God? Believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Why not begin with them that have already loved the Lord and are dedicated to going to worship Him? Why not start with that group because most of the work has been done already? What we need to do is get them into the book that they believe in and teach them the rest of the truth. Because somewhere along the line, they've been diverted from hearing and knowing and believing in this true and living God through Christ, and they know that. But somewhere along the line, they got connected to some men and women who then divert from what the truth is still using some scripture, using it incorrectly, but then fooling them and tricking them and making them think that here's the way that you become alive and clean and without debt and filled with Jesus. By praying a prayer. By having a little cross put on the forehead of a brand new baby. And the list goes on about what many teach is necessary to go from death to life. But church, I want us to know what Jesus says because he's the only one that can really do it. And, and I want to make this clear. Remember, this is a life now that we're giving to live under the authority of now Christ, not ours. His. And I want you to be reminded that we are dead, dirty, debt, and distant when we are in control. So we need to be reminded that we are relying on the work of Christ, not ours, to do the work. 
So open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3. Remember, I'm going to cut off probably after this section. We're just starting the introduction now. We know what the payoff pitch, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the payoff pitch. That's the funeral and that's the new birth. That's, that's the place where we go in dirty and he cleans us. That's the moment at which we go in filled with debt and he pays it off. That's the place where we go in single and we come out married. Amen? Amen? So now we're backtracking and we're going to do an extremely detailed study so that it answers all the questions that are out there. So if we just simply teach this, they won't have any answer to support what they teach. And hopefully they'll want to be alive and clean and without debt and have Jesus live with them. Matthew chapter 3. You there? Verse 1. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We now pick up our study at the very beginning of where Jesus has already been born. He's shown up at the temple at the age of 12. We don't have any record of Christ until what we're about ready to see. But God is so smart, he wants to make sure mankind does not miss the Messiah. So what he does is he then inspires this man by the name of what? John. To prepare the way. To lay out this beautiful carpet and path for Jesus to step right on and continue on. So John goes out preaching about the coming of the Messiah and he's here. And he's coming. He hadn't shown up in public ministry yet, but I'm telling you, he's on the way. And to prepare the way for the Messiah, John is preaching a message that the Jewish people, and all mankind, by the way, they need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins to be connected to the one who is to come, Jesus. I want you to hear what I just said. Baptism is not something new on the scene. When we get to Acts chapter 2, it has been taught for a long time about what baptism is all about. So when they teach it and preach it on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish crowd that is listening has already heard what baptism was for through the preaching and teaching of John. Maybe I need to clarify something really quickly. I know most of you know that baptism, the word in the Greek language, is baptizo. So what scholars decided to do is instead of taking the Greek word and giving us the English word that best describes the Greek word, they just decided to take the Greek word and sort of English it. Baptizo, baptize. Baptism. The word literally means to immerse. Now, what we need to do is as we read and study, we need to see it in that capacity. That the idea is to immerse. Now, I also have to say that this word baptizo shows up in seven different types in the New Testament. There are seven different types of baptism mentioned in the New Testament. There is only one connected to what we are teaching and what Jesus reveals to be alive, cleansed, debt-free, and 
close to God. Watch this. Verse 4. Now John himself had a garment of camel hair and a leather belt about his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Yummy! And I complain when I'm wearing a wool shirt. This guy's wearing camel hair and eating locusts and honey. He was one tough dude, I'll tell you that. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all, how many? All Judea, and how many? All the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they, say it, confess their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, you wa who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. What does he mean by that? He means y'all need to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, repenting of your ways. Isn't that what he's teaching them? Verse 9. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you, that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So he's saying, hey, listen, I've, I've heard you Jewish religious leaders in the past. I hear what you're relying on. You're relying on your lineage. I'm telling you right now, lineage isn't going to get you to heaven. Only God is through Christ. And so he wants them to respond to the beginning of that good news message that people need to come and be immersed, confessing their sins, connected to repentance, so that they are prepared mentally, emotionally, spiritually, so that when Jesus shows up on the scene, who will they follow when he does? Jesus. We making sense so far? Not complicated? I didn't think so. Verse 10, And the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's bad fruit? Bad fruit here is the fruit that doesn't follow Jesus. Sounds simple to me so far. And the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11, as for me, I baptize you with water. With what? For repentance. In Luke chapter 3, it talks about and forgiveness of sins. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We are now introduced to two of the seven different types of baptisms or immersions in the New Testament. So let me list them for you very quickly. If you're not taking notes, you can come and get these later on. I did not put them up on the Prezi because I didn't want to flash through them and have people have a seizure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, there's a baptism, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. There's a baptism of Moses or into Moses. That baptism is clearly talking about for the Jews connected to the time of Moses has nothing to do with this idea of New Testament salvation. The second is in Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, where Jesus is talking to his apostles, and he's talking, Jesus talks about the sufferings that he's going to be a part of, that he's going to be immersed into sufferings. And then he turns to his apostles, and he tells his apostles, hey, listen, you're not going to be a part of this yet, but you will be immersed into these sufferings someday. So baptism there is just symbolic to the apostles for what their lives will be immersed into when it comes time for them to carry the torch of Christ after Christ goes to heaven. 
Does that baptism have anything to do with salvation? No, other than the sufferings that the apostles are going to do for the cause. But it's not the immersion we're talking about at the moment you receive life. The third one is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, and it's the baptism for the dead. And it is housed and cased in the Apostle Paul talking about this beautiful resurrection, the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection through Christ. And so why in the world would somebody be immersed into something or someone that's dead? Does that make any sense? I mean, if you're trying to rely on or immerse yourself into being a follower of a dead Savior, how's that Savior going to do for you? No good. So Paul is trying to let them know that this idea of being immersed into or for the dead doesn't make any sense that Jesus is raised from the dead, so we're immersed into a living Christ, not a dead one. Number four. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, we have here. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire. What does that mean? We're going to see what Holy Spirit baptism is all about as our study goes on, so we'll hold off on that. That answer will come. Baptism or immersion into fire is talking about them being immersed into eternal torment. That doesn't sound like the immersion I want to be a part of. Baptism of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Mark 16, 15, and 16. And we'll list more of these later on. And that's this immersion into Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be born again. So, when we pick up the story next week, and we'll just finish reading Matthew chapter 3, when we pick up the study next week, I want you to have the framework of knowing this great plan of God. And he's been waiting, and he finally sends his son, and now his son is being introduced, if you will, by John. And one of the things John is doing is introducing to the Jewish nation baptism for the forgiveness of sins connected to repentance. Hold that thought. Verse 12, John, or Matthew chapter 3. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And of course, it's referring to that baptism of fire. Verse 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all unrighteousness. Let me ask you a quick question. If Jesus was not baptized, could he have fulfilled the ministry of God? The answer is no. Because Jesus knew as he came on the, on, the, on the scene that baptism being taught by John was commanded by God, and although Jesus did not have sin, and he didn't need to repent of anything, he still, at the very least, had to do it to fulfill the law, the whole law of God, by doing what God says to do because he loves the Lord and he's going to do all that God commanded. So, was baptism necessary for Jesus? Yeah. Without it, he wouldn't be our Savior. Now, we're just introducing the idea of this immersion into a tomb of water. And if our Lord had to do it because it was commanded by God, and without it, he couldn't get in, how much more is baptism necessary for us to fulfill what he says? 
Now, we're going to close this thing down here right after this. And then, after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus responds to the message of God through the teaching of John, the necessity to be baptized in a tomb of water. Jesus goes down into the water. He comes on out and he receives the Holy Spirit. Now, when we pick this thing up next week and go to John chapter 3, and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and when he says to Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, what do you mean? How can you go back into the mother's womb? And Jesus says, if you want to be born again, you have to be born of the water and the Spirit. Now, would that be a shock to people? Of course not. Because... Jesus was baptized. He publicly received the Spirit. God confirmed who Jesus was when he was baptized. These things you need to keep in mind. We're going to shut it down now. Whew, man, that's not bad at all. I know, I hope, and some of you are going, Tad, keep it going. I hope you are, because we're going to keep it going next week. I want us to be able to take this message, to take this series of message, who has friends who believe in Jesus Christ? Who has friends who are good people, who love the Lord, who are dedicated, and they serve God with much of their life? Do you have friends like that? But they prayed Christ into their heart, or they were baptized as a little baby. Do you have people like that? Do you want them to go to heaven? If you do, then you need to take this series, teach them this series, and let them know that they are still have a problem. That they're still dead. I'm not talking about starting a well, my preacher said, first thing I need to tell you is you're dead. No! That's not a great way to start off a Bible study. A great way to start off the Bible study is to share your common beliefs and faith in Jesus and love for Him. That's a great place to start. Read and study a little bit about Christ and things that he's done. Man, lay that foundation that you guys have this commonality of the authority of Christ being the resurrected Savior. Start there. And then start picking up this study. Because if they're not baptized into the baptism of Christ, they're still dead, dirty, filled with debt, and distant from God. I've got another question for you, and we're going to close it down. Where are you with him? Where is your real relationship with him? Are you dead? Or are you alive? Are you feeling dirty? Even though maybe you've been cleansed? And you need to have a re-cleaning? Are you feeling just weighed down with the heaviness of, of debt and sin? Are you feeling distant from God? Then today we offer this beautiful moment in our worship service called the invitation. And the invitation is offered so that people go from death to life. Go from dirt to clean. Go from being in debt to having it lifted off. Go from being distant to being united again. For those who are not baptized for the forgiveness of sins, that's the moment for you. If you want to give your life wholly to Christ, that's what you need to do. If you're a member of the Lord's church, but you're feeling dirty and distant, then please come forward and confess and watch that dirt be lifted by Christ and His power as we stand and sing the song of invitation.